This episode is sponsored by Financial Cop. The views expressed in this podcast are for informational purposes only and are not designed to advise you on how to handle anything specific to your finances. Nor are listening to this advice guarantee your financial success. Discussions in the show should not be construed as specific recommendations or investment advice. Always consult with your investment professionals before making important investment decisions. Advisory services offered through Retirement Plan Advisors, LLC, a federally registered investment advisor, RPA, and Financial Cop, LLC, are not affiliated. Nick is a registered investment advisor representative, licensed life insurance agent in Texas, and a certified master financial coach. Do your own diligence and educate yourself by your finances and how you wish to plan them. This is your future. Came a Grand Prairie cop, and it was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. And I remember I walked over to my kitchen table, and it was the first night I ever added up all my bills, and it was that night I realized as a rookie cop I was $80,000 in debt. The the real kind of bullshit old crap moment for me was Carrie's title changed from girlfriend to fiance, and I kind of forgot to tell her this little bit of information. So I had to go sit across the table from the girl I wanted to marry and explain to her the guy she wanted to marry was $80,000 in debt. Hey, Blue Grit Podcast, we're back this week. Um... Clay McNear, your host, and Tyler Owen, T.O. Uh, got a great episode today that I wish I had heard when I was yeah. 20 years old and Absolutely. Uh, 50 years old. Um, Nick Dotcher with Financial Cop. Welcome on. Welcome. Hi. We're not actually honored to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome to the Blue Grid stage, yeah. man. It's a pleasure to have you on. A lot, I think a lot of people are going to be beneficial from this uh this episode. Yeah, it's, it's funny, Clint. You say, I wish I had this 20 years ago. That's probably the number one thing that me and Mike hear when we teach classes. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it ought to be, and I'll, I'll get into a funny story about my academy class in a bit, but um, long-term guys, guys and girls would benefit greatly yeah. from getting this much earlier. Yeah. Um, how was your drive down this morning? It's good. Uh, other than Dallas traffic and Austin traffic, you know, the <laughs> yeah. two worst places. I guess you could throw Houston in there, but yeah, Houston's way better. I mean, uh, I think than Austin's yeah. traffic, in my opinion. Yeah, it's but smooth through Waco now. That's not bad. It is. I mean, until they try to start construction again. So, did your car drive like old Crown Vic, smooth sailing? Hey, don't knock on Crown Vics. No. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> we always kind of kick off. Um, Tell us who Nick is. Where were you? Where'd you grow up? Where were you born? Well, I uh, came to Texas as quick as I could when I was 18 months old. I'm uh, originally from Arizona, and so I'm pretty much born and raised in Texas. Grew up in Irving, and it's kind of part of my story. I grew up in the oh, south part of Irving. Shit. Are you from Irving? I'm uh, from Irving. What part? Irving High, right oh, there off O'Connor. I was uh, Nimitz High School. So oh, God. What, what class? 03. 03. I was 97. There you go. So okay. just a little older. I mean, yeah. I was as old as him, but. Yeah, yeah, no, we're not as old as Clint. <clears throat> yeah, and Emmett's Vikings. Yeah, Shout out to the Emmett's Vikings. Yeah. So. so grew up in Irving, and uh, you know, dad was a paint contractor. Mom worked in the retail industry, so we had a, we had a great. Where'd you grow up at? Uh, Shady Urban Story. Right yeah, there. exactly. Yeah. Good area. Well, back when we were yeah. kids. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about do now. You, do you remember the Minyards? Absolutely, freaking lootly yeah. man. Now it was just, it's a fiesta now. I'll tell you, interesting story about Minyards. I started as my first real job. ended up getting promoted to the produce department. Oh, and, shit. But out of the five or six of us in produce, four of us became cops. I'll be damned. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the Tallies grew up in Irving. Uh, a lot of Irving and then worked for Irving PD. But man, that was a great area. Back yeah. so I, I grew up around the corner from Menyers. My 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 uh, grandparents had a duplex. It's right there behind. Was it Burger Street? Yep. Best burgers in Irving. 100%. Oh my 100%. god! Yep. Yeah, right down the street from uh, Elliott School, Elliott Elementary. Yep. It, we Elliott was, was my uh, that was my elementary. Oh god! I, I went to Elliott as a kid. Uh, never be the same. And uh, after I went there, and so yeah, I graduated there from high school. 03. Nice. So seventy five percent of the Menyers. Um, vegetable department became police. What is it about handling rutabagas <laughs> yeah. and avocados? I don't know. It's, yeah. It was very strange. You know, it was, you know, became best friends with the first guy that became a cop. He went to DeSoto, and he's the reason I became a cop because I was he was my roommate at the time, and I was selling senior trips to high school kids, and you know, having a blast going to live in Cancun, and I got tired of dealing with the high school kids and. Watched him go through the academy, and I'm like, man, this looks like this could be a cool job. So that's, that's awesome. That's how I got into law enforcement. I'll be damned. Huh. She went from putting out avocados to selling senior trips and partying in Cancun. 
Yeah. That's a, that's a good transition. It was, <laughs> a, it was a big transition. You know, I you know, remember one day I'd, I'd gone to my senior trip, and I went back again the second year. And when I got back, I got a call from the VPSLs, and he goes, hey, Nick, I don't have anybody who's selling senior trips. Would you be interested? Oh, by the way, if you come work for us, you get to go live in Cancun, all expenses paid for two months out of every summer. And I literally quit Let my... Let me think about that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm ready. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know a whole lot of nitros <laughs> aren't going to jump on that. So I literally quit my job at the grocery store on Monday, dropped out of college the same day, flew to California Thursday to learn how to sell stuff, came home Sunday and moved out of my parents' house on uh, Friday, 12 days. Poquito Spanish? Yeah. Poquito. Muy poquito, yeah. <laughs> enough, yeah. To make, enough to make people think I speak it fluently to where I have to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Despacio. Yeah. <clears throat> so you moved to Cancun at 19? For in the summer, I lived in. I still lived in the metroplex of Dallas, but uh, every summer from for a, two months. Yeah, for about two months. Yeah. Was there a was there oh, a certain resort dangerous. that you lived on? Uh, so we worked with about eight or nine different resorts. So, so you just was, you just pick. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Do they still have that job available? Uh, I don't know. No. <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> we can work remote at TMPA, <laughs> so I would not mind doing that. I would not be in law enforcement if at nineteen I'd been in Cancun uh-uh. having it at a time. No. Well, you, you know you you, you I. People laugh about it. You lived in Cancun, but it's so instrumental to my actual story because, as you know, the south side of Irving is not the nice side of Irving. Yeah, it's and pretty so rough. While I had a great childhood. We didn't exactly live a life of luxury. So I went from working at a grocery store, I don't know, making seven, eight bucks an hour to selling senior mm-hmm. trips, making $48,000 a year plus commission. Which is a lot 19, back then. Yeah. In, in 1999. Wow. And that's a lot. So w- w- what happens when you hand a kid that came from not a lot, that kind of money, we start doing stupid stuff on steroids, which is no different than what we do in law enforcement right now, mm-hmm. right? We hire these rookies, 22, 23 years of age. We pay them more money than they've ever made in their entire life. We and give them a lot of responsibility they, too. They give them access to unlimited overtime and it's no yeah. wonder they do a bunch of stupid stuff with money. Yeah, absolutely. So where'd you go to, what, what law enforcement agency? So, you, so you're so you doing the, 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 the senior trip deal and then at what point did you were like, yeah, this probably isn't a career field that I kind of want to, Stay yeah. in. Yeah, I was getting tired of the wishy washiness of high school kids. And again, my roommate was going through the police academy at, for to become a DeSoto cop. And I mean, who would want to stay in Cancun with blow and, and strippers and, and, and nightlife <laughs> and liquor and this un- unbeknownst of, of, of party animal stuff type thing? Who the hell would want to leave that? We were the responsible senior trip company. Oh, At least that's what okay. I tell everybody. That's how I sold you the parents. And you went to Nimitz? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bullshit. Oh, come on. MacArthur was the party Well, okay. School. Yeah. Yeah. You're true. You're true. <laughs> So I decided to become a cop, and uh, Grand Prairie was the first of, I don't know, six, seven, eight departments. I mean, back then, that's what you did, right? You applied for every yeah. place because there were 400 people at every test, and Grand Prairie beat out Fort Worth by about 30 minutes. And so, yeah. so oh, wow. yeah, I became a Grand Prairie cop, and it was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. That's what awesome. year was that? Uh, 2003. Grand Prairie were in their own academy at that time, or did you go to a regional? Uh, went to COG. COG, oh, yeah. yeah. Arlington, right? Yep. Yeah. In what year? I uh, graduated, it, well, I was hired in 03. I graduated the academy in August of that next year, or that year, actually. Okay. And Grand Prairie back then was, Grand Prairie's changed a whole lot. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> yeah. They did not well, have the. I mean, I got hired in Garland in 92, and nobody would have applied at Grand Prairie yeah. in the early 90s. And that place is is the place. I mean, yeah. it is one of the premier places to work yeah. in North Texas. I mean, so. it, it was a rough place to work for. I mean, we had a lot of really bad areas. We didn't have a lot of good areas. And, you know, it's it's changed dramatically uh, <coughs> since then. I mean, now it's, again, one of the premier law enforcement. I mean, right now, as we do this podcast, if you told me Grand Prairie would be the highest paid agency in North Texas, I would have laughed at you. Yeah. yeah. Well, cause, and, and what's weird about Grand Prairie is typically, historically, for most cities, the south side of any city is typically your worst side. Okay. But Grand Prairie, it was strange because the north side was the rough part. At least when I was growing up, we would go to Grand Prairie High School. Was at the Gophers, yep. I think? And then the south Grand Prairie side was the nice. Yep. It was the Indians or Warriors. Warriors. Yeah. And they were red and gold or red yeah. and yellow. But, uh, yeah, Grand Prairie has always been kind of a weird Weird place, but it was it was it was nice back. The South Side was. I, I give you an interesting statistic about Grand Prairie. It is the longest city in the state of Texas. Really, it is twenty seven miles long. We border Venus on the bottom, Fort Worth at the top, and at our biggest girth, we're only eight miles wide. Wow, no kidding. Yeah, which is why we had such a crime issue because yeah. you had. 30 and 20 on the south. You had 360 and um, uh, uh, loop 12 on the uh, on the sides. And, you, mm-hmm. of course, they built George Bush in the middle. So, right. I mean, think about it, any crook and that's smart knows I can go into Grand Prairie, steal a car, and I can be out of the city before they even call 911. 
Yeah. It's also the central hub for the dope, too, because, I mean, you got 20, 30, 360. Yeah. So that's what I saw as a kid. Yeah. That's who I didn't want to be was one of those guys. But. but, again, it's just, I mean, over the last decade, it has, I mean, the, the, the crime has plummeted. The, you know, the, the quality of the department has increased tenfold. It's just, it's, it, like you said, it's the premier department to work for right now. I think Grand Prairie 2's success goes back to good leadership. Yep. Mm-hmm. And there's no perfect chief. There will never be a perfect sheriff, a perfect person. But the guy going in there, the faults that he had, he wanted to put bad guys in jail. Yep. He supported the officers that went out and did legal, lawful, aggressive police work. The citizens want that. They oh, want yeah. to feel safe. Oh, yeah. And that's when Grand Prairie started to change. And the 100%. current chief now, Cessny. That, yep. Um, everybody I talk to is like, man, all, all he worries about is us and our mental health yeah. and making sure we're doing a good job. Yeah. And Grand Prairie went from, quite frankly, being a kind of a crap hole place that nobody would have ever applied yeah. for. Or it would have been like number 14 on your yeah. list to apply for. Yeah. Now yeah. when people call me from outside the state or hey, I'm in South Texas moving north. Grand Prairie's one of the yeah. first couple that I'll tell them, man, you probably need to look at Grand yeah. Prairie. You mean look at Cessna. I mean, Cessna, he's a cop's chief. Yep. I mean, he's he, he's a line level guy. Yeah. And and he's never forgotten that. Yep. <laughs> and it's sad that people like that are anomalies, not the norm. They should be the norm. Yeah. Not not the strange unicorn type yep. chief. When you look at like Garcia, we just had that we don't you know we had Dallas our ATO on uh, last week or the week before last and Yep. I mean, just the leadership that he's got with the mental health and the owl unit and stuff. And it's, it sounds like Grand Prairie is doing the same yep. thing. Because back when you and I were growing up, Irving PD was pretty – they were pretty high on the yep. on the totem pole as far as respect the agencies yep. in the area, uh, yep. along with Dallas. And, of course, I can't I can't not not mention Garland. <laughs> not Garland for the obvious, obvious reason. So, anyway. Cool. So, went through the academy, went to COG, hip, uh, FTO, turned out on what shift, Deep Nights? You know, I, I'm. It's a strange. I never worked deep nights outside of being in training. Not even when I was a sergeant. Oh wow! Dang. And so that we go back to the you know early two thousands in Grand Prairie, we were on eight hour shifts, and the deep night shift was the premier shift. Everybody wanted that shift. So when I got out of the academy, I got out of field training, and we went to our first bid. I mean, you couldn't even bid for deep nights if you were a rookie. Well, by the time I finally was able to qualify to bid for deep nights, I had a choice. Go to deep nights with Tuesday, Wednesdays off or stay on evening shift with Friday, Saturdays off. And I was dating my fiance at the time. Yeah. And so it's like, so it, 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 I, I would have loved to work deep nights. I had a blast when I was on in training on deep nights, but I just could never qualify. And then I promoted to sergeant and same thing. I ended up being on day shift the entire time. <laughs> Lucked out there. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. So how many years in patrol before you made sergeant? Uh, nine years. Well, so I did five years in patrol and went and be, was a school resource officer for three years, worked at the high school on the alternative campus. And then I served on an underage alcohol and drug task force. And then, then at nine years of service is when I promoted to, uh, in my opinion, the single best job in the department, which is patrol sergeant. Uh, unfortunately I'm a nerd, hence the money. And as you know, when you work for the chief of police, uh, as a sergeant, you work at his will. So unfortunately I got a call one day, I said, Hey, go up to the chief's office and Walked up and Steve, I said, hey, you heard about the intel sergeant retiring, right? And I'm like, don't do this to me. I've never been in a cubicle in my entire life. And he said, eh, need you to take over intel. And so I uh, did three years in patrol, and then that's where I rounded out my career was in, in intel. That's awesome. That's cool. What, what high school did you were a school resource officer at? Uh, did South Grand Prairie for a little bit, then Grand Prairie, and then the alternative <laughs> campus. So I was both. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's a drastic difference between both of them. Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, just a tad. Yeah. I grew up with some Grand Prairie guys in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying that I'm an angel. Yeah. But. And retired what year? Uh, so I left law enforcement full-time as a sergeant in 2017, gave up my sergeant stripes. I still served as a reserve. Uh, officially gave that up about two months ago, and that I've had my official 20 years of service. So you can still get your years of service as a reserve? Yeah, well, I'd not qualify for retirement-wise, but qualify for 20 years honorably retired for carrying-wise. I got you. Yeah. Okay. So... You have an interesting story of of what began the path for you for financial cop. What year in your career did that kick off, or just I guess start from the ground? What what? It's a crazy story. Yeah, it really started back with the senior trip company. Uh, I mean, I was making a crap load of money, and I just you know, was driving crappy cars at the time because I was working at a grocery store, right? I mean, my first love of my life was a nineteen eighty nine silver Ford Festiva. Right. Silver bullet, basically, <laughs> or the silver bubble. And 
I put a stereo in there because, you know, what What are you supposed to do as a kid? It'd take the back seat out and put a stereo. Well, I... It's always smart to put a $3,000 stereo in a $2,000 yeah, car. Of course. That's <laughs> a South Irving thing, too. The two, was, <laughs> it was, you know, I, I don't actually tell the story in my class, but the reason I got rid of that car is I had to get rid of it because the stereo actually broke one of the welds in the roof. So, every time the base hit, it, 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 yeah, it was horrible. And so I ended up getting a 1993 Honda Civic Coupe, putting a stereo in that. Then I started doing the senior trip, and you know, a buddy of mine was like, you know, hey, man, you make $48,000 a year. That Civic doesn't look like a $48,000 a year car. And so I upgraded that car and got a 2001 Honda Civic Coupe and, of course, used credit cards to put a $5,000 stereo in that. Unfortunately for me, I went to a car audio competition at Dallas Market Hall one year and walked out and said, man, my car sucks. And I decided I wanted to compete on that level. So the year before I became a cop, I dropped my car off at the car audio shop and said, I want to be one of the top 10 cars in the nation when it comes to sound quality. So I went back to Cancun, came back home two months later, and picked up a $21,000 car stereo system in one car. All on credit cards. Wow. Um, I was playing the credit card shuffle game where you're shuffling credit cards around to get 0% interest transfer and they get another credit card. And I became a cop and I discovered the most beautiful program in the world when I got done with training called STEP, right? Select Traffic Enforcement. <laughs> so did Grim Prairie not look at your credit? Uh, so I had good credit because I always paid my bills. I just had a lot of it. So on wow. the credit aspect, so I didn't flag. Okay. Yeah, yeah I didn't definitely flag. flagged with it. Um, and so I started working overtime like crazy, and it was a good thing I did because I kind of had gotten myself worked into a situation where if I didn't work 20 hours of overtime every week, I couldn't pay my bills anymore. God well, bless. Any kids at this point? Or no just... kids, not married yet. The best advice my dad gave me when I got hired, he didn't want me to be a cop. He said, if you're going to do it, you're not going to become in, in enslaved yeah. Yeah. to part-time jobs. Yep. And he said, you're going to have buddies that are part-time horse and i'm just telling you not to do it. best piece of advice i ever yeah. had and i didn't have the money some of my friends had but i had buddies working 20 hours a week every week for the first 15 that, years we were that there that's practically me wow. and, and, and the thing is is that the stereo destroyed the car and so i had to rip it out so here i am with about thirty thousand total on all my calls car stereos and credit cards and i got a car that's seven thousand dollars upside down on the balance and a buddy of mine said, hey, you should go to Grand Prairie Fork because they take care of us Grand Prairie cops, right? We all literally destroyed your car. Oh, yeah, destroyed the electrical system completely. <laughs> and so I went to Grand Prairie Ford and said, hey, I got a problem. I'm 7000 upside down on the balance of my car. And he goes, runs my credit, comes back with a big old grin and says, don't worry about being 7000 upside down. We'll roll that balance into the next car. What kind of car would you like? I said, man, that yellow Mach 1 Mustang was pretty. <laughs> and so I bought a brand new 2003 uh, Mach 1 Mustang as a rookie. And, of course, you know, when you drive it like you stole it because you got a badge and a gun, you also have to replace the brakes and tires every six months like we do in our squad cars, and right. that became expensive. So I decided, I well, backtrack, I also met Carrie at the time, who I just figured out quickly was going to become my wife, and so I thought maybe it's time for me to go get me a grown-up car. So I decided to do something even worse and go trade that Mustang in. Mind you, 7,000 upside down on the Accord, several thousand upside down on the Mustang, and I did the worst thing you can do, which is lease a car. Oh. I leased a fully loaded $36,000 Acura TL. And I got home one night exhausted, not exhausted because I worked my shift in patrol, but because I did five hours a step before my shift started. And I remember I walked over to my kitchen table, and it was the first night I ever added up all my bills. And it was that night I realized as a rookie cop I was $80,000 in debt. Wow. Credit, like credit cards and car payments? Credit payment. cards and cars. That's all it was. All credit cards. And, and of course, you're probably renting or doing the courtesy officer thing. courtesy definitely. officer, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, heck, if I had lost the courtesy officer job, I'd have been ruined. I'd have, I'd have had to go up to 25 hours of overtime a week. So what do you do with $30,000 worth of stereo equipment? Uh, it gets sold for about 2500 bucks. Trader's Village. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not worth very much. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, we just moved recently, and I actually still have a couple of the old pieces because I couldn't park because they're so expensive. I'm like, I'm not selling this $1,600 speaker for 100 bucks. Yeah. So at eighty grand, how much on credit cards? Uh, probably about forty ish to forty five ish was all in credit cards. What is minimum payment for for young listeners or or non law enforcement? What would minimum payments just to keep the principal yeah. moving on forty thousand look Something like? Around four fifty to five hundred ish, give or take. Wow! Not counting the lease payment on the car that was all upside down equity as well. And your up and your percentage rate at that point was what eighteen twenty percent. Uh, well, it's a lease, so it's an internal that you don't technically see with it. So it's it's part of how they sell the leases is it's not about the interest rate; it's about the monthly payment. Uh, but I was in order to afford the monthly payment on all the upside down equity, I had a very low mileage allowance, which was setting me up for a 
another balloon payment. Balloon. Yeah, down the but road. I'm talking about on the on the credit card. You're looking at 18, 19. Oh yeah, I mean, easy. I don't. I mean, easy. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what they were back then. I mean, today the average interest credit card is twenty percent plus. So wow. So four or five hundred every month, just to keep the principal. Just to. I mean, just to just keep, to tread water. Just to keep it yeah. basically neutral, boy. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So at what point did you were like, man, this is bullshit. I got to do something about this. You know, I, I, I added the debt up that night. I was $80,000 in debt. And I think the, the real kind of bullshit, old crap moment for me was Carrie's title changed from girlfriend to fiance. And I kind of forgot to tell her this little bit of information. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. So I had to go sit across the table from the girl I wanted to marry and explain to her the guy she wanted to marry was $80,000 in debt. She happened to be debt free. And, and if you will marry me today, yeah. we, yes, we can do together. We $80,000. 18% yeah. if you want to pay, baby. Yeah. So you can imagine the look on her face. And I looked at her and I said, Carrie, I got a plan. And she kind of looked at me back and she said, you better. I was very lucky. You know, when I got released from training, my beat partner was a 20-year vet that became one of my best friends. And he was that car that would, that cop that would go car to car and pound financial wellness into their head. I ended up getting introduced to the Dave Ramsey program at the time, too. And I fell in love with this debt snowball mentality. And I committed to carry that night that I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm going to pay off all $80,000 before we get married. What year was that or about how old were uh, you then? This was about 2005-ish, give or take. Okay. And so I pushed our wedding back a little bit. And over the next 24 months, I worked over 1,000 hours of overtime. And on March 3rd, 2007, we got married 100% consumer debt-free, everything wow. but the house. That's awesome. So, so you started... On what roughly what day with eighty thousand uh, dollars? Some somewhere in two thousand five ish, mid two thousand five. Yeah, and on when were you out? March third, two thousand seven was our debt free day. Damn, two years. Yeah. I did that intentionally so I could always remember our wedding anniversary. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> two years. Yeah. Now you know I, I always I have people when we teach the class we go through a progression of things. You don't pay off eighty thousand dollars in debt by working a thousand hours of overtime, right? I, I had to get rid of some stuff. Yeah. And so what was the first thing I got rid of? It was the Acura. I was upside down up to, I mean, I was way upside down. I ended up having to get a, I sold it. I had to get a loan for the difference because I was so upside down. And I ended up driving Carrie's then 2001 V6 Ford Mustang that I hated because it was a V6 and it was beat up and I had a Mach 1 before. But it was paid for. And we bought her an Altima and we started working that debt snowball and, and that's how we paid off everything. And it's that whole sacrifice. I mean, for two years, I drove a shitty car. For two years, I didn't go to restaurants. I didn't go on vacations. We live like no one else. And if you go out in the parking lot right now, there's a fully paid for, uh, fully loaded Acura TL out there. You know, that's th- that's what you have to get when it comes to the finances. Is it's about the sacrifices initially, so that you don't ever have to sacrifice down the road. Yeah. yeah. But that's how this started. Is that's where I started getting interested in finances. So for our listeners, what when you sat down and realized, okay, I have eighty grand, or I- anybody. If they sat down and, and looked and said, okay, I have a boat, a car, a house, I have $30,000 on credit card, uh, maybe a little student loan, what would a person, what would the initial assessment would you tell them to begin a snowball plan? Look at interest rate first? Look no, at the it, first? it actually isn't even the snowball you look at first. It's the number one thing we hate doing that you have to look at first. It's the dreaded B word, a.k.a. the budget. Yeah. Like nothing starts with a plan unless you have a budget. You can't pay off debt, just like you can't really technically save for retirement and a vacation and, and other things without understanding what your budget is. And so I had to get a grasp of what my outflow versus my inflow was. And I kind of came to a realization that, you know, we have this gift in law enforcement called overtime, right? Yep. And far too many of us use overtime as a mechanism to elevate our standard of living. Well, I changed and said, you know what? We're going to use overtime to build our financial strength, and I'm going to use it to accelerate things. And so I really cut down on the budget, right? No restaurants, no vacations, those kinds of things to figure out what I had wiggle room-wise. And then through that and then continuing to work 20 hours of overtime since I was already used to it, We use that to build the debt snowball. And you mentioned interest rates. You know, there's two schools of thoughts. There's the debt avalanche, which is kind of Susie Orman's method, where you list your debts from highest interest rate down. And then there's the debt snowball, where you list your debts from smallest to largest. And I get a lot. Okay, I got you. Get a lot of debates with people about well, if you do the avalanche, you're focusing on the highest interest rate credit card first, so you're saving more money. Well, yeah, but see, money is not a mathematical equation, money is a psychological equation, right. Right. right? It's the psychology. I get people, you know, we deal in the cops, you guys at TMPA deal with this, you know, we need, we need raises, we need raises, right? We're not getting paid enough. And I'll agree. Yes, we need to get paid more, 
But all too often you hear these cops go, if I could just get a 10% raise. Well, no, the, the raise doesn't help. The, the money is the symptom. The problem is us. We have to recognize what we're doing. And good statistic, two things I've studied since I got involved with this, marketing of debt and millionaires. And I've read just about every study of millionaires you could ever get your hands on. And the largest one ever done was by a guy named Chris Hogan. He, he wrote a book called Everyday Millionaires where he surveyed over 11,000 millionaires. Of the 11,000 millionaires surveyed, a third of them reported becoming millionaires having never earned more than $100,000 in any given one year of their entire life. Wow. No kidding. So I've got a couple questions. <clears throat> so, one, I've always been told in my whole life, live debt-free, pay off your shit. Okay, so that means my house, my cars. But now I've got another financial guy uh, that has nothing that's not affiliated with TMPA. Uh, it's just a guy that my father had used in, there in the Metroplex. And he was telling me, and just for your listener, our, our, our listeners out there, give you kind of a, a, an understanding. Uh, I'm transitioning from God's country to South Texas. Well, not South Texas, Austin, south of Austin. And so he was telling me, he actually made the recommendation of, man, get, get your house and get it financed, which was mind-boggling to me because this is coming from a financial guy. My entire life, just like your dad did, he told me, hey, get your shit paid off. And then I've got a truck. My wife's got a, a Jeep. Of course, you know, those are low interest rates. And so his ideology behind it is, is like, man, you're not paying that much in interest. So if somebody's in my situation, any listeners out there, uh, what recommendation would you have just off that? Is is yeah. it is it smart to pay off your debt, or is it is it better on taxes? I mean, what what wh- yeah. where's the happy medium here? So you got to understand something about the financial world. Um, the financial world, just like cars, just like grocery stores, they're all trying to make money. Yeah, and if you don't invest with them, they don't have what's called billable assets. And this is one of the biggest things that is core to us in the financial cop team is that. We look at financial planning from a different perspective because I go back to millionaires. And when you study millionaires, do you know what millionaires don't have? Debt. They yeah. don't use debt for anything, right? You know, you, you, you talk, if you ever watch Shark Tank, right? You know, you know, Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, constantly writing articles. You want to become wealthy? Stop using debt for everything. Why? Because one of the number one characteristics of millionaires in this country They don't play the interest game. They play the no payment game. Because what does that payment do to you from a cost opportunity down the road to be able to do something else? right? In the retirement plan space, I get in arguments with my peers because they're like, you're telling people to stop contributing $50 to $100 a check and pay off credit cards. Well, first off, why are we trying to convince somebody to put money in the stock market and hope we make 10% while we're paying 20% on a credit card? That's about half backwards, right? That's right. But the second thing is, is if I can get somebody debt-free, Build a fully funded emergency fund. Now, when the water heater goes out, we don't have a crisis moment. We're not raiding the 457 or doing a, a deferred comp loan. But more importantly, instead of doing 50 to $100 a check, you're doing 500 to to $1,000 a check. And so I'm going to catch up quicker. And then at the end of the day, when you retire, your retirement account's going to be bigger. You're going to be financially prepared for retirement. And you're not calling your financial advisor going, I need money because my AC went out. You're calling your advisor because you want to <laughs> yeah. go on a, a fishing trip, right, or, or, yeah. or a cruise or something. Yeah. And so that's or live in Cancun. Correct. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, and so that's the difference. Is is yes, your interest rate may be lower, mm-hmm. but at the same token, what is that payment that you're tied to costing you in the form of opportunities? We go back to law enforcement, right? We're we're, we're losing our brothers and sisters in this industry like crazy. I mean, you guys remember back in the day we got into this job and it was, man, I got to do 30, 35 years. Now it's, yeah. I got to do 25 to 30. Now it's just get me to 20. Yeah. yeah. I'm and, limping across the finish line. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and how many, you, I, the, didn't, I didn't, I didn't finish it. Yeah. But in the field, how many times have you heard a cop say, I just, I, I got a dream. I got an idea. I just, I, I, I don't want to, I, I can't leave law enforcement. I don't I don't have any other skills. Right. What I've found is that a good chunk of those, it's not that they're scared because they don't have any skills. It's they're scared because duty. They're, they're tied to a payment they have to make. Yeah. Now, when I left law enforcement, I, mean, I jumped off a cliff, right? I gave up $100,000 a year salary, right? My pension, I had one of my fellow academy mates call me recently to start planning his retirement. I looked at him and I said, man, I hate you. And he goes, why? I go, we were hired together. I'd be qualifying for my pension right now. I got to wait till I'm 60. And so I jumped off a cliff and I had people tell me, you're an idiot, man. You're giving up this government job. But I had no debt to hold me back for a dream. And so when I jumped off the cliff, I went, my worst recourse is if this doesn't work out, I go back and I'd be a lateral somewhere. Oh, damn. What did I lose? Yeah. Yeah. 
how many of our cops get held back because it's about having to have a certain income to fulfill the payments, but they're miserable because of it. Mm -hmm. So to his point about like houses, a house is a pretty good write-off each year in taxes. Does that balance out if you pay your house off? No. Let me ask you this. If I gave you $100, which would you rather have, $20 back or $80 back? 80 back. So if you take $100 in interest and you write that off your taxes, what you're saying is I'd rather give the bank 80 bucks so that I don't have to give the federal government 20 in the oh, write-up. Gotcha. I'd rather have the $20 go to the federal government and keep $80 myself. So the whole tax write-off you know, equation of this just doesn't compute when you dig yep. into the math. It's kind of like the you'll hear financial advisors say, don't pay your house off, invest in the market because your, your, your mortgage is 3%, yeah. but you can get 10 in the market. <clears throat> well, that's a play on marketing words. If I do the math with the interest rates, that works. If I change the equation to the dollar amount, it doesn't anymore yeah. unless you have $300,000 to put in the market. Because if you make an extra principal payment on your house and that saves you $800 in interest on the back end of your loan, but that thousand dollars goes in the market and it makes 10% this year, what did it make? It made a hundred bucks. So same kind of equation. It's just, again, mar this is why I studied the marketing aspect just as much as I did the millionaires, because it's just a play on the numbers to make it look good in that perspective versus another perspective. I can't wait to live here and go tell my wife. <laughs> so you recommend, I've always heard, hey, if you can make that 13th house payment each yeah. year, you recommend that? Uh, to a certain degree. And so we preach, we have our program that we call the eight phases to financial training. And, you know, if you've ever followed Dave Ramsey, he has his seven baby steps. And we designed our phases of training to kind of mimic the FTO phase, right? We've all been through field training. We know you don't start in phase one and go to phase four, right? right. Sometimes you can accelerate the phases if yeah. you're a lateral because you get to skip some stuff. Yeah. But unfortunately, sometimes recruits struggle and we got to pull them out of training and they've got to go to remedial to fix the problem. Sometimes when you're working a financial plan, the water heater goes out. It's time yeah. to go to remedial and step out of the plan, fix the water heater, and go right back into the plan. And so we preach those phases where we preach phase one being budgeting, right? You've got to do a budget every month. Phase two is to create a $2,000 baby emergency fund. Phase three is to do the debt snowball, focus on becoming debt-free, paying off everything but the house, then we go into emergency fund savings, then we go into extra retirement savings, then phase seven is, I'm sorry, phase six is save and invest for big purchases. You got kids, let's talk about college planning. You want to buy a Corvette. How do we buy it? You know, buy that Corvette that doesn't cause us to go back. I need to skip to that phase. What yeah. is that phase? <laughs> Remember, live like no one else. You can live like no one else. Then we get to phase seven. So I don't want to go full bore on paying the house off until we're debt free with an emergency fund. But then I don't want to go full bore on the house while neglecting retirement at the same time. Yeah. So we start to do those in conjunction. So in law enforcement, we talk about tunnel vision is a bad word, right? Tunnel vision will get you killed. In finances, tunnel vision is pretty good in the beginning, right? I want to tunnel in on the emergency fund. I want to tunnel in on being consumer debt free. But once we get to phase five, now we can go back to our head on a swivel, right? Yep. I want to focus a little bit towards retirement, a little bit towards, you know, big purchases and a little bit towards paying off the house so that we can get back to living like no one else. So what do you think as far as you, you, you mentioned, I think it's phase three, the emergency fund, kind of padding that emergency fund. Yeah, phase four, actually. Phase four, sorry. Uh, I was going off. Clint, Clint told me three. Uh, what point, how much should one have an emergency fund? Because, I, I, again, back to kind of my parents raising me or my, my, my wife's father. He always told me three months, at least three months. Is that a good is that a good recommendation for our listeners? Yeah, three minimum. I prefer closer to six just yeah. because we're cops and we like to plan for the worst. Right. And so I'd rather have I, – I've never met anybody that said, oh, damn, I saved too much. Yeah. So for our listeners, <laughs> yeah. to, to be specific what you guys are referencing, emergency fund. So everybody's cost of living may be very different. Some people's debt may be five grand a month to survive – some may be three or 10, whatever it takes. If, if me and my spouse become unemployed right now, the amount of money it would take for us to continue survive yep. for three months, five months, six months, whatever, yep. that, whatever that fund, and it's going to vary for every family, but whatever it would take if both of us are unemployed or the apocalypse happens today that we can survive. Yep. Is that right? Is that fair? It's really easy to figure out because remember, phase one is the monthly budget. Yeah. So what your monthly budget is, that's what you multiply times three or six. Now, you got stuff in there you can cut out, right, in an emergency, emergency. But that's a general th rule of thumb as we tell people what your rough monthly budget is. 
three to six months of that. Hmm. It makes sense. And, and, you know, this is what's fascinating, just to kind of segue into to, to a second part of this or third portion. You were a TMPA member when they were at Grand Prairie? Still am, yeah. Still am, you know. And then you've got Mike Parker. you got James Babb. you got guys that are actually cops, right? And that's what I find always awesome about you and your team is the fact that <laughs> – you guys have been where we're at. You've you've been the twenty one year old guy that's made obviously a hundred thousand dollars. But I know God knows it wasn't back then. Whenever whenever you started Grand Prairie, it was poor like probably fifty or sixty. But man, you've you've walked the shoes that most of your clients that you're giving this advice to, and so that's what I find so awesome about financial cop. And I find that you know you're not preaching something to somebody that you didn't walk yourself. Yep. You're not preaching financial advice to doctors or lawyers. I mean, you're you're preaching this shit to cops that you know because you've worked in it. Yeah. You might, James, and, you know, you're always trying to expand that team with other cops. And so, you know, I just kudos to you for doing that, man. Uh, it, it's, you know, I got it in this industry because I, I, I wanted to have somebody that had a voice that understood, yeah. right? Far too often. I mean, there's a lot of really good financial firms out there, a lot of good financial planners, but the reality is, is unless you've put a gun and a badge on for 10, 15 years, you just don't understand. Well, let's call a spade a spade. Cops are weird. I'm calling a lot. You can get pissed <laughs> off. Tyler Owen dot, at Owen at TMPA.org. We're a strange bunch of people. Just a little. Yeah. And so to give advice to a certain industry or a certain group of people that we know as cops, <laughs> it takes a special breed of person. Well, and we're a bit hard-headed. The funny story I was no. going to share <laughs> My academy class started 31. I think we graduated 28 or 29. Last day of the academy, we had a commander named Plumley, Rex Plumley, kind of like Sergeant Major Plumley was in uh, A Few Good Men. Not A Few Good Men. Um, yeah, I'm fixing it off. I'll say it in a minute. The Marine Sergeant. We were soldiers. Yeah. He was just like him. He was a rough, respected, hard man. Last day of the academy, he said, y'all are going to field training. You're gonna, and back then, Z71 trucks were the thing. <laughs> Z71 trucks. What do you mean that There still the are. Thing. Oh, man. It, they, Not like they were back then. The right, Z71s right. had just come out, that Z71 yeah. package. Yeah. They had just come out. Plumley said, 28 of you are going to field training. A bunch of you morons aren't going to make it. And I know a bunch of you dumbasses are going to end up at a car dealership. This was on a Friday. A bunch of you dumbasses are going to be at a car dealership tomorrow. I'm telling you, don't go to a car dealership. Because you're not going to make it through training. What would you go buy? A Z71. <laughs> so when I pull onto the back lot, we had the weekend off. When I pull on the back lot that next Monday night, Sunday night or Monday night, for our first night in training on deep nights, Garland at the old station, the parking lot was really dark out yep. in the back. So when I pull in, I black out because <laughs> I had dealer tags, and we were told don't do it. So I'm trying to hide in the trees and park in the dark. Well, I look, all these other Z71s with paper tags – are pulling in trying to park. So I get out, and it's all my academy mates. We're all in brand-new Z71 trucks. I, I, have, I have a slide in my class. It's called the FTO Starter Pack. And when I tell my story, I get to that point where I say, you know, hey, look, I fell, I, I fell for the FTO Starter Pack. And it's these pictures. And it says, this is what we do, right? We get the academy. We get a sports car or truck. We get a rifle. We get a tattoo. We date a nurse, a teacher, or a dispatcher. And <laughs> yeah. we're broke, right? Yeah. yeah. We're just Buy four broke. guns. Yeah. Yeah. Universal, right? Yeah. Four wives. Oh. <laughs> that comes a little oh, comes yeah. after FTO. Yeah, that's right. Uh man, do you got anything else that you want to kind of touch on that, that you think's crucial to the you know listeners and, and law enforcement guys that, that are in financial situations right now that they can maybe call you or lean on you? Yeah, so one of the things we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you guys a QR code to throw up here. And so anybody watching this, uh, you know, we're 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 well known for two parts. We're really well known for our financial wellness. Yep. You know, we're one of the largest in the country. We've taught over thirty thousand first responders from three thousand agencies, and we have our entire virtual academy. And so, what we're going to offer is anybody watching this pad- podcast can get free access to that awesome. for a full year. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so we've got our four-hour class on there right now. Within the next uh, couple of months, we're actually adding budget workshops, retirement seminars. Uh, we're building one of my uh, a class that's near and dear to me. We're actually going to put out outside the academy for free. We're building a premarital financial coaching class for first responders. So the QR code you're talking about, they can click on it and get this for free? For free for one year. And so we'll – Where are they going to put it, Clint? See if you can guess. Put right, it right here. Right here. Right here. <laughs> or right here. Right here. Hover right here. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the second thing we're known for is the financial planning. So we are a fiduciary only financial planning firm, which is a unique entity, right? There's about 300,000 firms out there. What does that mean? So a fiduciary is a term <laughs> that says you're required by SEC regulation to put the client's interest ahead of yours at all times. Not just some of the time, but all times. Mm. 
Now, in break that down into dumb caveman marine it, terms. So you get two different types of financial firms out there. You got what are called broker dealers, and you got registered investment advisors. So the fiduciary is under the registered investment advisor side of things. Think probable cause, right? Have to do what's right at all times. The broker dealer side is under the suitability side of things. Think reasonable suspicion, fifty one percent correct, and about ninety percent of the firms out there are dual registered. So you kind of never know which one you're really working with. And there's nothing wrong with being dual registered. You just need to understand that aspect. Can you ask a firm if they are? Yeah, you know, in the class you guys are going to get access to for free, we actually have a section. It's my favorite section called How to Interrogate Financial Planners. Good. Right? We're cops, right? Yeah. We go ask tough questions on the streets to elicit lies. How do we ask these financial planners and advisors the same questions to elicit either a lie or elicit some trust? And yeah. Again, I get a lot of flack from my peers about this. Don't care. This is about taking care of our brothers and sisters. And so that's the question we tell people to ask is, are you a suitability advisor, a fiduciary advisor, or both? And if they come back and they say, well, we're a fiduciary advisor, well, that's that's fine. So let's follow it up and go, well, do you also have your suitability license? And if they go, well, yeah, well, you asked them both, and they tried to straight, you know, kind of go skate a line. Oh. And so put them through the ringer on that. If yeah. they say they're both, ask them, okay, how are you going to treat me today? Are you going to treat me like a suitability advisor, a fiduciary advisor, or both? And then the number one question, which is my favorite, is is fees. What are your fees? I tell people that you should be able to slide a four by six postcard across the table and say, Mr. or Mrs. Advisor, what's your fees? If you get past the second line of this four by six postcard, I'm going to get up and leave. And, there, and there's yeah. some new laws that are best interests on the suitability side where the, you know, that would have to be explained in a contract, but it's kind of one of those how well do they explain the contracts in that right. sense. Whereas instead of having to come and go, I think this is the best product and convincing you and selling you on that product per se, on the fiduciary side, there is no selling of products because that advisor gets compensated the same no matter what they do. Oh, gotcha. It's designed in a manner where if your investments do better, we do better. If they go, if the market goes down like last year, we go down and our, our fees go down. So it's 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 more transparency. Gotcha. And yeah. that's what we're really big at at Financial Cop is 100% transparent. I tell people all the time it's a blessing and a curse to work with my brothers and sisters. It's a blessing because we can sit across the table and we are cops. There's that icebreaker. It's a curse because if you screw up one thing, you might as well shut your doors right. Word travels fast in this industry. Oh, yeah, yeah. And amongst law enforcement. If yeah. you screw one of us over, then you kind of get yeah. that idea that, that they're going to be, yeah. you know. So. It's, it's it's why we're honored to have the support of TMPA. It's why we're honored to be the exclusive endorsed firm for the Relentless Defender Apparel Group. So we've we've got some pretty big people behind us that have said well, we go, and it, Shout and out it, to Slater. It, oh, absolutely. And it goes back to what I just said a while ago is the fact that your team have been all been cops. And that's why I've always really, you know, uh, not that other firms out there aren't as respected as financial comp, but the fact that you guys walked the same shit that I did, yeah. you guys have been, doing, you know, had to make the arrest and had to fight the people and walk the same walk as every other cop out there. That's what I find, you know, so honorable, uh, you know, that you're you're now giving advice to cops that, that basically our membership made up of a member. So. And, 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 you're, and, and you're, we tell people all the time interview all the e firms right you just, right. just don't go with somebody because we're a cop right you know, re- put them through the ringer interview well and you're, you're you are a good looking man yeah, I, mean, I mean there's no I doubt about it today. yeah yeah you did <laughs> you are trainers for fop as well is that right uh so we have taught for the fop wellness symposium twice we did their conference a couple years ago so we yeah we have done some stuff with them we've been teaching for concerns of police survivors for geez i think six out of the last seven years uh yeah. so we've we've done some pretty pretty major conferences where we just not we don't just get invited to go teach we get invited to come back over and over which is i think one of one of the biggest things i am honored when i get an invite back I'm well, glad you, uh, go ahead well no i think that's cool because y'all have taught at limit leadership you've taught at caruth police institute teaching young leaders and i think y'all teach all new supervisors at dpd Dallas uh Bay. not dpd uh so we teach all the school of police supervision classes for ilea that's right that's uh, right we teach all the leadership academies at caruth we do the leadership command college at lima we just got done with all 1200 chiefs for the police chief leadership series so we we we, we hit a lot of the leaders uh throughout their career yeah. as and these aren't just optional these are some of these are mandatory classes these supervisors have to go through and we had joe king host of bridging the divide um ato Dallas ATO podcast on, and he said that you guys are going to be again collaborating on wellness, financial yep. wellness, yeah, uh, adding to enhancing their wellness program. Yeah, we're looking, from the, looking to figure out how we can kind of help support them too. Yeah, cool. That's good stuff. And I, I think just just follow back on the concerns of police survivors and and so forth. We don't, me and Clint, not saying we're failing, but we we don't mention this enough is the fact that how important having a good will in place. Speaking of financials. <laughs> 
Uh, and if you're a TMPA member, you get that as at, at, at no at, that is a benefit of your membership package. So you and your spouse, if you do, yeah, if you do not have uh, a will in place, I strongly, strongly, strongly urge uh, our listeners, uh, if you are a TMPA member, to reach out to a field rep. You know, give us a call one 848 We can get that set up for you through Kelly Foreman and Randy DeBravo. I'll well, give you a sidebar. We we have a giveaway on our our website where if you go there at the bottom of every page is a a free download for a sixteen page fillable legacy go bag there you go right we all have a, a go bag in our squad car well what's our legacy go bag for our family to create right. so that if god forbid that day happens your family knows where to go to pick absolutely up the yeah that's great. great great advice on to's note when you update your will if your will is two ex-wives ago as a beneficiary update your will contact the city or the county update the beneficiary there those don't all cross over yeah if you're in tmrs tcdrs contact them Update your beneficiary, your 401k, your 457. Contact us and update all of that. A lot of people update a will and they think all of those things populate and cross over. Every It'll, every two years, we tell people every two years, I don't care if nothing's changed. Pull your will out. Make sure it still meets what your your wishes are. And then go not just change, but go verify the beneficiaries are still correct. Yeah, We had TMRS on several episodes ago. Yep. And my, I did not know awesome this. Awesome episode. Yeah, great episode. Those, uh, those shout out to Debbie Munoz. Yeah, yeah. So I did not know this. A will does not supersede a beneficiary on your TMRS. Or, or your 457 <laughs> yeah. or your IRAs. Yeah. So your will may say, I'm giving all my shit to Nick and Clint. And they can fight amongst them however they want to dispute it. But if my... We beneficiary, can work that out. yeah, it ain't gonna Leave be it much. Like we'll work it out. Yeah, and, but if my beneficiary package says that I'm going to give it to Natalie Garza, uh, our awesome, uh, you know, blue grit uh, co-host here on the on, on the backside that we never get to see, she gets all the money, not Nick and Clint. So I just want to be clear on that. If you do not know that, that's why Clint was mentioning TMRS, TCDRS is that fact that you have to change yep. your beneficiary, you, except your will. You guys have seen the horror stories we oh, have on the horrible. crisis, the crisis coaching we do with 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 officers that have passed away. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we get there, and it's like, hey, uh, I, you know, we, does he have a pension? Yeah, he has a pension. Who's the beneficiary? The ex-wife. Uh, yeah, yep. and that's like a, it's it's almost like they have to relive that that horror uh, oh, story yeah. again, and it's just it's horrible. It's a bad. He and him have seen it. You've seen it. It's just a bad situation. So, what is? And it may be a dumb question. No. What is the number one? <laughs> what is the number one failure that you see young cops? begin is there is there one thing that you could say that it's the thought process of i don't need to do anything to prepare for retirement because that's a I long have, way from now because yeah. i have a pension right I, when we teach academy classes i hear people all the time i don't need to do a defer comp right i got a pension and by the time they realize that the pension's not going to replace their income they've lost their most valuable asset which is time yeah and so we, we, we got to get these. We're actually working through uh, an entity right now where by the end of this year, we're hoping to make our virtual academy free for all recruits in the state of Texas as kind of a trial before we expand that out nationally. Because if we can get these young recruits to recognize, hey, I need to start doing a budget. I need to get my debt under control. And we start getting them you know, saving for retirement. Now, when we get to 20 years, if we want to go, we go. And we're not stuck with what every department has, which is grumpies in every briefing that brings the entire shift down because they're miserable because they hate this place because they can't afford to retire. I wonder if financial wellness will ever be. Of course, it's not going to be as, as as big as you know mental wellness or health, you know, physical wellness. But <clears throat> how awesome would it have been if you or I would have had financial wellness being taught in the academy? Yeah. What's well, like they've had to do in the NFL? Yeah, they realized in the NFL. You're giving a 22 year old kid a couple million dollars a year. You're Absolutely, not teaching. He yeah. doesn't even know how to open a checking account. Yep. Why don't you teach that from the ground <laughs> yeah. floor? Yeah. Before you turn, you know, yeah. a 20 year old NFL with millions of dollars or a 21 year old cop with no bills and, and 70 grand. There's no idea for next, You're setting yeah. them up for failure. Yeah. That, that's what the recruits are. Is they are millionaires. They're they're, they're yeah. They're, I mean, if you think about it. From the day you start working in this industry till the day you retire, most of our cops are going to earn three to four million dollars in income, and so they are millionaires. Yeah, you know, it's just a matter of what you do with the pieces of the puzzle during that time period that dictates whether you stay a millionaire or you retire broke. I'm that's calling it right now, powerful. Clint McNear and Tyler Owen, and maybe even Nick Daughtry. We will try our damnedest next year to maybe file get a bill filed. Maybe financial wellness can be added to the academy. Oh, I thought you were going to announce right now that within a couple of years we're going to be millionaires. Oh, well, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> just put you on, put me just on as, as your beneficiary. Just take some discipline. Yeah, so right. to your point, 
um, one of the guys in the academy that graduated ahead of me got an FTO named Mark Castile. Shout out to Mark. He told the uh, he told John, "Do you have any debt? No, you know John. Do you have any debt? No. Do you have any kids? No. Do you have Do you have any debt? No. To get out of my phase of training, you're going to walk across Street City Hall. You're going to sign up for the max." 401k or 457, 457. Yeah. you're going to max it out or I'll fail you out of FTO. And John told me the story a couple of times. He's like, I was so freaking pissed off. But it, was a, it wasn't that many years later when he knew the date he was becoming a millionaire. He literally knew the date. Wow. Within, I think, six or seven years. Yep. He knew on what date he was going to become. And he's like, now I could kiss Mark Castile's face. And t- it, it shocked me that a 21-year-old kid right now that gets hired at Grand Prairie or wherever needs to understand if you live right, you're going to earn $4 million, 3 or $4 million yeah. in the next 25 years. You have a choice right now. You can be like this fat guy talking right now, or you could you could, you could could retire a millionaire with 25 or 30 well, years on. And it goes That's back, huge, it, man. It goes back to what you said earlier about the do I pay off the house or do I you know, invest, right? You know, one of the things that we, our philosophy at Financial Cop is, is, is the KISS principle, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Why? We're not teaching anything that's revolutionary. Right. This is stuff our grandparents did, right? Yeah, and 100%. It's, this is, it's just common sense principles. But I know that when you keep things simple, things tend to work out. Yeah. When you start getting complicated in financial plans, you start <laughs> yeah. trying to do all like, that's where... Murphy happens. Murphy mm-hmm. is going to happen. A kid's going to break a leg. An AC is going to go out. A car's going to break down. But if I keep it simple, we create the the fail safe, right? If if my AC goes out and I got to replace my AC unit, does that suck? Yeah, it sucks. But does it stress me out financially? No, that's what the emergency fund's for. Is right? there a is there a percentage that you recommend before we hop off here of what somebody's? Let's just say that one of our listeners, uh, their in, their total income monthly is five thousand dollars. Is there a percentage of what you recommend on total bills? So your total bills would be a house, car. Uh, if they do have credit card debt, we're going to yeah. take that out. But I mean, is there a percentage what you recommend yeah. with financial? Co- what 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 is that? So for your mortgage, I like to try to keep your mortgage as close to twenty five percent as possible of your of your gross. And just to be your gross. I'm sorry, okay. of your take home pay. Take, take home pay. Take-home pay. Okay. So principal, interest. Co- Taxes and your insurance. Combined household income. Combined household income. Okay. I need to get my calculator yeah. out. So <laughs> yeah. it, it, can you go over that? Yes, they will approve you for more than that. 25%. But it, anything more than that, it gets tough to do other things like retirement planning. Yeah. And, you know, for cars, we recommend that you add all the engines in your home up. So boats, ATVs, cars, etc. The value of your engines in your household should not be worth more than half of your current take-home pay. And that's an indication that you don't have too much tied up in an asset that's going down in value with an asterisk. I tell people all the time, you know, I don't like buying brand new cars because of the depreciation factor. Mm -hmm. We do a whole lesson on this in the class. But when you become debt-free with an emergency fund, you're saving for retirement and you're the, you know, assets minus liabilities, you're officially a millionaire. If you want to go splurge on a car, go splurge on a car. You've earned that right. Pay so cash for it. Cash, well, well, yeah, exactly. Cash for it. You know, we tell people after babies or after financial phase four, you're debt free with a fully funded emergency fund, and you're you're you, you've got nothing but the house left. If you want to fly first class, fly first fly class, first class, yeah. right? Go drop a hundred fifty bucks on a steak. You know, live a little. That that that's you deserve that. It's about the sacrifices early, right? You want a boat? You can buy a boat. It just needs to be in the right phase, <laughs> yeah. not when you get out of the academy, right? Cool. I just want to, I thought about that. Yeah. I want to go back to Nick, the cop. What was your best day on the job and your worst day on the job? Ooh, uh, worst day on the job was Christmas. And I don't even remember the year. It was the, the shooting we had on Christmas day that it drug on all day long. It's just, um, you know, I, I was fortunate as a Sergeant never have to be on duty when we had an officer shot that passed away, but we had, you know, several officers shot that day. Uh, best day on the job. I don't know, just about every day I was a sergeant on patrol. I mean, that. I mean, there is no better job than patrol sergeant. It's a good you know? gig. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's your, it's your, you're, you're in the middle, right? You, you, yes, you have some admin roles, but it's your ability to still be one of the guys and affect change and, 
You know, I, I, I actually, if you want to know my favorite day, um, hopefully this dispatcher's not listening. <laughs> we had this dispatcher that for years, right, it's 5.58 right before quitting time, and there's a delayed BMV report. And so when I got promoted, I was lucky. I was a nine-year sergeant, so I got put on the 30-year veteran shift. <laughs> and so I gained a lot of respect the first week because even though I was the baby, this dispatcher, 558, I don't even remember what number, you know, 135 responded to this you know, BMV report that's delayed. And I'd been wanting to do this for my entire life. And I got on, I was like, 130, 130, go ahead. I believe that call can hold for deep nights. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was one of my favorite things I ever did. <laughs> that's awesome. So got a lot of street cred with the guys. who was like, Hell hey, yeah. finally somebody in it. But two, I got to tell a dispatcher for years and she couldn't tell me no. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So what would 40-year-old Nick tell 17 or 18-year-old Nick? Um, there's speakers that sound just as good that aren't 16. No. <laughs> Jensen by yeah. Jensen. Kicker. No, I, I, kicker. You're kicker. You're not, not, kicker. Jensen, not Jensen. Not Jensen. Oh, no, no. Jensen, bad word. Yeah. Um, I, I would go back and say, you know what? It's, it's, it's okay to splurge a little bit in moderation, but don't think that you have to have the image of the Joneses. Yeah. Right? You don't have to have the best of everything. And it was, it, it actually was easier back then because we didn't have Facebook. Right. It's tougher now. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Social media plays right. a big part and, of it. And, and that was what I wish is that I didn't have to have the impression of look at me. I'm going on all these vacations. I'm buying these nice cars. I could have still had nice cars. I could have still had a nice stereo system, but it didn't have to be that nice. Right. Don't live a solid champagne, advice. Yeah. Champagne lifestyle on an old Milwaukee Correct. budget. Yeah. And if you do that, when you do get to 40, guess what you do get to do? You get to live the champagne lifestyle at that point. If you take the right steps in your discipline, you get to enjoy it then. Yeah. Solid advice. I like it. All right, man. We got some rapid fire questions coming Ooh, at you. Oh, good. Uh oh. What is your favorite cop movie, your line from a cop movie, your favorite patrol vehicle, and your favorite drink of choice? Favorite uh, patrol vehicle, hands down, Crown Vic, anybody that says yes. not. So They're... I was the fleet coordinator and I was the last sergeant to ever drive yeah. the Crown Vic. I'm telling Vic. you, you're not going to win this debate. Yeah. Crown Vic, this, it's a workhorse. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's the workhorse. Cop movie. I gotta be honest. I I didn't watch a lot of cop movies because I really embraced the when I was out the door, I was out the cop mode. Yeah. So I just never watched a lot of cop. That's movies. smart. That's yeah. all. That's good advice too. Uh, drink of choice. I'm weird, right? You know, everybody in Texas, they're all bourbon drinkers. I am a rum fanatic because of my Cancun days. Yeah. I'm uh, talking like rum that you drink like bourbon on the rocks that you would just like 18 year old and yay age don poncheo 18 year i've had people in my house are like rum like, okay i'll get you bourbon i'll hand them a dark glass and they'll start drinking they're like what the hell is this i'm like rum, rum. Yeah. and they're like no we had another big rum drinker on uh <clears throat> matt is malinsky i think was his last name the lubbock guy He's a huge he rum guy. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Is it high on sugar, though? Isn't rum high on sugar? It is, but the good in Yale rum is just, it doesn't taste, you have a hint of sweetness. It's just, it's like a good bourbon. It's just smooth. As long as it doesn't taste like Angel's Envy, I am no. 100% okay. So what, what would a good quality rum, what brand, what, what would uh, I look for to try? Don Poncheo, 18 years, my favorite. They have a seven-year-old that's a little lighter that's good for rum and coke. Uh, Escapa is another one. They have a white label that's good for rum and coke, a black that's a little bit better, and the XO is good just on the rocks. Uh, those are my two go-tos. Cool. All right. I like it. Yeah, absolutely. You got anything else, Clint? Nope. Um, click on the QR code. QR code that he'll probably put <laughs> over my face. Right yeah. here, right? Uh, yeah. That's a great opportunity. Appreciate you guys coming on. And your staff is Mike Parker. James Babb, and I've got um, uh, Brian Box, who's a retired sergeant from Carrollton, and then we've got uh, our back end staff with Amy Parker and Carrie Darty, uh, wife of Mike and wife of me. <laughs> and so awesome. your staff, uh, Grand Prairie, Mesquite, Plano, and Carrollton. And Carrollton. Oh, yeah. Good. With rapidly, we're going to be expanding into multiple states in the next 12 months as well. Good. Wow. Good deal. Awesome. Man, I appreciate you, brother, again. Yep. And, uh, you know, you, your, your experience and everything, it's just, uh, it goes to show that, man, you just know who you're investing your stuff with. And uh, that's why, again, I'm, you know, y'all being cops and everything, it's just a good, it's just a good program. So, 
Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you, you coming in. Honor from, be here. Hey, you guys stay safe out there. Hit that like, subscribe button. Do not beat up Clint too bad. If you guys have any questions, bluegrid at tmpa.org. It's bluegrid at tmpa.org. Man, it's been a good episode. It's been good. Drive that uh, forward like you stole it when you go home like a Crown Vic. I will. It'll be mm-hmm. northbound. God bless you guys, and as always, may God bless Texas. We're out. Mm-hmm.